the work he did, the words he spoke, and the life he lived. Bill Fulbright stood against the 20th century's most destructive forces and fought to advance its brightest hopes. In a lifetime of service to his country, J. William Fulbright spoke to the nation's conscience, confronting Joseph McCarthy, promoting a visionary student exchange program, and challenging the war in Southeast Asia. Not seen fit to Fulbright's life and ideas remain among the most significant in American political history. Despite his distinction as one of the 20th century's most influential political figures, J.W. Fulbright often referred to himself as a simple hillbilly from the Ozarks. J. William Fulbright was born in Missouri in 1905, and within the year, his family was on the move. His father, Jay, was a businessman looking for opportunities. Jay packed up his family, crossed into the Ozark Mountains, and settled in the town of Fayetteville, Arkansas. This setting fit the Fulbrights well. The family lived in a stately home overlooking the University of Arkansas campus. Bill Fulbright grew to consider this his true home for the rest of his life. At age 16, Fulbright entered the University of Arkansas as a member of the class of 1924. He became student body president and a homegrown football star. He delighted the fans with the winning field goal in the homecoming game against Southern Methodist University. But two years later, tragedy hit the Fulbright family. Jay Fulbright died suddenly, leaving Bill fatherless with control of the family in the hands of his mother, Roberta. Roberta Fulbright was the strongest influence in Bill's life. After her husband died, she successfully ran the family businesses, taking particular interest in the newspaper. In 1924, Fulbright graduated from the University of Arkansas and earned the chance to study in Oxford, England as the recipient of a prestigious Rhodes Scholarship. I grew up in Fayetteville, it was a little town of about 6,000 in those days, and uh, I didn't know anything about it. I'd never been abroad. I'd never been to New York or Washington or San Francisco, or even in this country. And it was a terrific experience to suddenly be in Oxford. Fulbright began his studies at Oxford in the fall of 1925 three years that he later called the most wonderful time of my life. At Oxford's Pembroke College, Fulbright displayed impressive athletic ability, competing successfully in three sports and even earning a position on the international lacrosse team that toured the United States in the summer of 1926. He joined a social club, the Teasel, where he learned to drink and smoke and was tapped as the only American member of the prestigious Johnson Club. Fulbright's family joined him at his Oxford graduation, and his mother encouraged him to take time to travel through Europe, where he met Michael Fodor. And I ran into Fodor, and he was a very distinguished uh, uh, journalist. And he took me with him as a sort of an informal assistance, which enabled me to go to meetings with him. And I got acquainted, I don't mean personally, but I observed his meetings with some of the important politicians throughout the Middle Balkans. And he recognized the value and the importance of this kind of experience, of being exposed to other cultures and other peoples, of, of seeing things through the eyes of others, seeing things as others might see them. Fulbright returned to the United States, a well-educated and well-traveled young man, but with no definite plan of action. On a visit to Washington, D.C., Fulbright met Betty Williams, an outgoing young lady from a prosperous Philadelphia family, and a courtship ensued. In the summer of 1932, Betty Williams and Bill Fulbright married, and Bill enrolled at George Washington Law School. 
After graduating second in his class, he took a job teaching law at George Washington. Fulbright worked for a time at the U.S. Department of Justice before the couple moved to Fayetteville so he could teach at the University of Arkansas. The move allowed Bill to be closer to his mother and to lend a hand with the family businesses. Along with his teaching and work for his mother, he became a father with the arrival of his and Betty's first child. The family grew to include two daughters, Betsy and Roberta. By all accounts, Fulbright was happy and content. In September 1939, the president of the University of Arkansas was killed in a car crash. Roberta Fulbright's friend, Governor Carl Bailey, appointed Bill the school's new and very young president. Fulbright rebutted those who believed he was too young for the job with his trademark wit. I really mean no offense by it, he said of his age, but I am confident that definite progress is being made every day to correct it. Upon election as governor of Arkansas, Homer Atkins, a frequent target of Roberta Fulbright's caustic editorials, promptly fired the young university president. So he had the board remove me, and that was all right. I really wasn't too disturbed because I had moved down there and had a nice country house and was interested in raising cattle, etc. And I wasn't too disturbed. Then one of my students, Clyde Ellis, came along and said, why don't you run for Congress? So I did. I, I was out of a job. I didn't have anything particular, and it was interesting. Anyway, we had a very vigorous race, and I won it for the House. Fulbright ran for Congress as an underdog. He set out in an old Ford pickup, traveling to country stores, farms, barnyards, and rallies. It was fun to do, because it, in our state, it was small and rural, with a great oral tradition of storytelling and listening. And you were supposed to get out and stir around. You had to actually, if you wanted to get elected something, you couldn't just run television ads. You had to actually go out and meet people. In November 1941, J. William Fulbright won a seat in the 78th United States Congress. Betty and Bill packed their bags. They were headed back to Washington. Fulbright took his seat as a freshman congressman amid the erupting chaos and conflict of World War II. The war and its aftermath provided the perfect stage for the independent-spirited, internationally-minded Arkansan. Fulbright quickly made a name for himself as a legislator by introducing a resolution that led to the formation of the United Nations. Wary of the public's isolationist stance before the war, Fulbright was reassured by the support of mail and phone calls that flooded his office. The Fulbright Resolution was overwhelmingly approved by Congress in late 1943, paving the way for the creation of the United Nations. Fulbright was happy that he had made a mark on international affairs so quickly, and in the process had dispelled myths about the inability of first-term House members to get things done. Everybody assumed that just because a fellow comes from Arkansas, he couldn't read or write, Fulbright said. But that's where they were wrong. In 1945, Arkansas Governor Homer Adkins again presented a challenge by running for the U.S. Senate. After two impressive terms in the House, Fulbright turned his eyes to this even bigger prize and attempted to settle an old score in the bargain. So I decided to run against him, and that was a very hot race. And I won it and was there 30 years. So that's how I got in. I had no intention of being politics in the beginning. And nobody in my family had ever had out run for office. My father was a farmer and then a businessman. So it was just one of those accidents. In the summer of 1945, Fulbright's efforts on behalf of a worldwide organization of nations came to fruition as representatives of 50 countries gathered in San Francisco to draft the United Nations Charter that his resolution had called for. 
The creation of the United Nations was a triumph for Fulbright, as shown by President Truman's enthusiastic support. If we do not want to die together in war, we must learn to live together in peace. To press the momentum of the UN's formation, Fulbright envisioned a new international scholarship program. He devised a plan whereby the United States agreed to forego the debts foreign countries amassed during the war in return for funding to create an educational exchange program. So he has an idea and he introduces a little sort of devilishly simple resolution that you take this material, this surplus material, the debts and you trade it in, and you get the United States to finance, to forego the debts and finance an exchange program. That is to bring people together around the world. The United States will finance people coming here and back and forth. And it was done so nobody even paid any attention. I went back and looked at the papers at the time. It was just a little resolution and it sounded like some of the most boring, obscure possible thing in the world. There wasn't a single note in the papers in Washington about this resolution. But out of that came the most extraordinary exchange program literally in the history of the world. When I first became head of the Fulbright Association, the first thing I asked him was, how on earth did you think of this program? What was going on in your head? And he said, you know, I was a Rhodes Scholar, and um, I know how much it transformed my life. So right after we dropped the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, I held hearings in the Senate to find out the long-term effects of this radiation and this extraordinary new bomb. And what I heard was so horrifying that I spent the next several months trying to figure out how I was going to help prevent World War III. And it became clear to me that if we could persuade young potential leaders to go to another country for long enough to have to confront the culture and to really learn uh, a different way of being, then when they really became leaders, they would be more inclined to exchange ideas instead of bullets. On August 1, 1946, President Truman signed the Fulbright Act creating what became the largest educational exchange program in history. The Fulbright name was soon recognized the world over, associated with the cause of understanding and peace between nations. The senator's efforts on behalf of peaceful international relations were challenged in the following years. In 1950, Fulbright was critical of the United States' entry into the Korean conflict, he was concerned that cold warriors, in their zeal to combat communism, were undermining many of the values they were pledged to preserve. We may find someday, without quite knowing when or how or why it happened, Fulbright stated, that we have destroyed our own constitutional democracy in order to save it. To Fulbright, Senator Joseph McCarthy of Wisconsin came to embody this threat to American democracy. In a 1953 Senate appropriation hearing, McCarthy threatened to kill funding for the Fulbright Scholarship Program, charging the exchange program educated communists. Fulbright replied that he had come prepared to insert into the record thousands of statements from Fulbright scholars that refuted McCarthy's charges. Flustered by Fulbright's poise and defiance, the senator from Wisconsin unleashed a barrage of taunts at the man he now called Senator Halfbright. But McCarthy withdrew his demands and never again challenged the Fulbright Scholarship Program. In February 1954, the Senate approved continued funding of McCarthy's subcommittee by a vote of 85 to 1. The lone vote against McCarthy was cast by Senator J. William Fulbright of Arkansas. If this country cannot destroy 
this senator's influence, I see no real future for it because it will undermine the very moral basis of our kind of government. Fulbright's views were not always popular, but he had become a respected voice in the Senate on international affairs. In 1959, Lyndon Johnson, the majority leader, persuaded Theodore Green, the aging chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, to step down. After 15 years in the Senate, Fulbright became the committee's new chairman, and with this post and power, one of the world's most influential men. In contrast to Fulbright's strong leadership in international affairs, the volatile issue of civil rights in America found him less at ease. In response to the 1954 Supreme Court ruling in Brown versus the Topeka Board of Education, senators from southern states put forward the Southern Manifesto, a document declaring their unwillingness to abide by the order to integrate public schools. Fulbright wanted to dissent and contemplated breaking publicly with the Southern Bloc over the issue. But he feared that such a stand would inevitably lead to the loss of his Senate seat, and he believed he could better serve the country by remaining in office to continue his work. The facts of the political situation trumped Fulbright's personal views. He signed the Southern Manifesto, a decision that troubled him throughout his career. I think, one, he was a very practical politician, and two, I don't think that Fulbright, Senator Fulbright, ever intended to be halfway thought of as a segregationist. I don't think he was a segregationist. Did he ever lay awake at night figuring out how to keep African Americans from going to school with his children? Of course not. He did not think that way. And I said to him in a session discussion one time, uh, Mr. Fulbright, you are a great thinker and operator on foreign affairs. That was his forte, foreign affairs. Why do you then uh, vote the party line uh, on civil rights? You're not only a great thinker, but you are a great man in respect to foreign affairs. And uh, why do you do that? He said, uh, Mr. Sutton, before you can be a great man in anything, you got to get elected. I used to argue, he used to let me argue with him when I was 22 years old. We argued about civil rights all the time. And I don't think that, you know, his civil rights record stands up well in history as anything other than a way to keep getting elected so he could do other good things he could do. It affected him deeply. It's the only thing that I remember in the long conversations we had almost over a year, this is back a long time ago during the biography of, of him, that he was uncomfortable about because he felt it would affect him in the future. Fulbright's apprehension was well-founded. Following his election in 1960, President John F. Kennedy, impressed by Fulbright's thinking on foreign policy, considered the Arkansas Senator for the post of Secretary of State. Fulbright's voting record on civil rights prevented his appointment. But Fulbright never wanted the State Department post, since he would lose his senatorial independence to become, in effect, a presidential employee. Even after Kennedy appointed Dean Rusk, who shared Fulbright's distinction as a former Rhodes Scholar, Kennedy continued to value Fulbright's opinion. As the administration plotted to overthrow Fidel Castro in Cuba, the president sought Fulbright's views. Inviting the senator to accompany him back to Washington from a vacation in Florida, the president took Fulbright into his confidence. And when then on the plane, he said, we're having a meeting at the State Department at 7 o'clock or so. Would you like to come to that? Well, anyway, he went over and he had a press conference, and then we went up to this, to the, one of the, the uh, rooms in the State Department, 
and they well, they were gathered there, oh, eight or ten members of the of the of the government and some of the top military people, plus Secretary of State, etc. And I was the only member of Congress there. At one of the last meetings of the people who were involved in planning this misbegotten expedition, uh, Kennedy invited Fulbright to come. And, around, and Kennedy went around the room asking people their opinion as to whether we should go ahead with this. And Bill Fulbright gave a superb um, presentation uh, saying that this expedition was unconstitutional, that it was illegal, that it violated our treaty obligations, that it wasn't the kind of thing we should be doing as a country, and so on. And I was very much impressed by it. I think that uh, Kennedy was rather impressed by it. And most of the other people in the room uh, were not impressed by it, and this, the thing went ahead. Castro, Fulbright said, should be regarded as a thorn in the flesh, but not a dagger in the heart. The Bay of Pigs operation was a military and diplomatic disaster. At a later meeting with leaders and advisors, Kennedy leaned over to Fulbright and in a voice loud enough for others to hear said, well, you're the only one who can say, I told you so. In October 1961, President Kennedy received a report that more military advisors were needed to aid South Vietnam in its civil war against the Communist North. Fifteen months later, he increased American forces there from 500 to 10,000. Few Americans were focused on that distant conflict, and concern was just beginning among members of Congress. When I first came to the Senate in 1963, we were already in Vietnam, and I uh, approached Senator Fulbright on the floor one afternoon and asked him if he was concerned about it. And he said with this kind of ornery variety of humor that he sometimes manifests, he said, well, I don't even know where it is. He said, do you worry about things like that? I said, well, as a matter of fact, I am somewhat concerned about it. He said, well, I don't even know where how to get to Vietnam. I've never been there. But he said, uh, I don't know, we got so many things to worry about around here, I just haven't been able to focus on that. And he just kind of dismissed it. Yet I had the feeling that he was listening very carefully to what I uh, had to say. I learned a few days later that he'd told somebody George McGovern was a very good young man. Uh, I, I like being referred to as young and also being uh, uh, described by a senior senator as a good man. Uh, but it wasn't too long after that that he began uh, asking questions about Vietnam. In the fall of 1963, Fulbright's growing concern over events in Vietnam was overshadowed by tragedy. The senator had advised President Kennedy to cancel a planned trip to Dallas. Fulbright himself had been subjected to verbal attacks from right-wing elements in Dallas and he privately told the president he should avoid the city. On the evening of November 22nd, after being sworn in on Air Force One, President Lyndon Johnson arrived at the old executive office building in Washington. The first person he met with was his good friend, Bill Fulbright. Johnson knew he could rely on Fulbright to ease the burden thrust upon him so suddenly. Despite their mutual respect, Bill Fulbright and Lyndon Johnson had only two things in common. Both men were from the South. Both were strong politicians with a no-nonsense style. 
Lyndon Johnson and Bill Fulbright were uh, different in temperament, heaven knows. I mean, you could not have more different types of personality. Lyndon Johnson was a big, massive, sort of hungry man in private. I mean, he bellowed and roared and told wild stories, but he also was the most formidable political leader that this city has seen as a majority leader. Um, at the same time, and they did have sort of common hunger about making a difference, but they, but Fulbright tended to be quieter, more scholarly, more thoughtful. At the same time, there was enormous respect on either side. As majority leader in the Senate, Johnson was so impressed with Fulbright's skill and knowledge of international affairs that he often referred to him as my Secretary of State. When I'd worked in the Senate, uh, Senator Fulbright was considered a, a fount of wisdom by LBJ on foreign affairs. Whenever he made a speech on the Senate floor, LBJ would sit there and listen to it from beginning to end, which I don't remember his doing with any other senator. <laughs> on August 5, 1964, President Johnson summoned Fulbright and other congressional leaders to an emergency meeting at the White House. North Vietnamese naval vessels had attacked American destroyers in the Gulf of Tonkin. Johnson turned to Fulbright for help. Trusting the president's portrayal of the incidents, Fulbright cooperated closely with the administration, using his position and prestige to help guide a resolution through Congress that gave Johnson authority to respond to the North Vietnamese with military force. It was a hot August day, and I remember walking over to the Senate floor that day with Gaylord Nelson, my longtime friend in the Senate. He told me that he was worried about the open-ended character of the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. He said, I don't want that thing to be an excuse to escalate the war. And I said, well, you know, I have the same worry, and I'm, uh, I'm very much concerned about it. Why don't we talk to Fulbright? He said that he had a resolution that he had drafted which amended the resolution to read something like this, nothing in this resolution shall be the occasion for escalating American military involvement in Vietnam. I thought it was perfect, but when we talked to Senator Fulbright about it, he said, look, I agree with that, but if we amend this resolution, it's going to have to go to conference. The House can't take it without a conference, it's going to delay it several days, and he said, Lyndon wants this thing as quickly as possible. It doesn't mean anything anyway. Uh, I wouldn't be sponsoring it if I thought it meant any change in policy. It's purely a matter of handling the situation uh, politically to indicate that the Congress stands behind the president. This is a bipartisan effort. And that's the way Bill Fulbright saw it. And with some reservations, um, Gaylord and I agreed to, to go along without offering an amendment or raising any complaint about it. I regret that very much. Fulbright delivered for the president. Two days after the reported attacks, Congress overwhelmingly approved the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. But Fulbright's trust in his friend was soon shaken. In late April 1965, the United States' attention turned from the jungles of Vietnam to the beaches of the Caribbean as news came of a revolutionary uprising in the Dominican Republic. On April 28th, President Johnson announced that United States Marines had arrived in the Caribbean, quote, in order to give protection to hundreds of Americans who are still in the Dominican Republic and to escort them safely back to this country. But within days, the administration radically changed its justification for the incursion. The American nation cannot, must not, and will not permit the establishment of another communist government in the Western Hemisphere. And I remember myself looking off outside uh, in Santo Domingo and seeing the weight of the might of the United States Navy, weighed anchor. And the, and the record was that Johnson was talking, there were thousands of communists and they were beheading people and they stuck people's heads on poles. None of it was true. It wasn't true. It was hyperbole. And he saw, he, Fulbright, saw out of this backdrop a kind of reach that the president was making that he thought was dangerous and not truthful. Fulbright was angry and confused, and he had nowhere to turn. 
His aides counseled the senator to avoid an open brawl with the president that could crush Fulbright politically. Fulbright prepared a speech in which he would, for the first time, openly, directly criticize Johnson. His aides split on whether the speech should be delivered. Lee Williams and Carl Marcy were the principal uh, opponents of the senator going public with a statement on the Dominican Republic. I remember at one point, Carl said, well, Senator, this is going to get you in a lot of trouble in Arkansas. Uh, and Senator said, well, I don't, didn't ask your advice on Arkansas. I'm the politician. I'll worry about that. I want to know what your view is on the substance of this statement. Carl said the substance of it is sound and accurate. He said, well, that's what I want to know. I thought I knew a little about Lyndon Johnson. I thought I knew his character and, and what Senator Fulbright criticizing him publicly would do to his ego. So I, I took the view that Senator Fulbright should never make such a speech, that there were other ways to handle it one-on-one, -on -one, certainly not to do it publicly. And I remember Lee Williams, who was the AA from Arkansas, he thought it was a very bad thing to do, was to make an open break with Johnson. I don't know, it may have been. Uh, history will have to determine that. But uh, personally, I thought it was my duty, if I saw it differently, it was my duty as chairman of the committee to say so, whether it was right or wrong. I, I, I expect I made a number of mistakes on that basis. That, but I thought, still think that's the duty of any chairman. He has to call it the way he sees it. And if he's wrong, he's just wrong. That's all there is to it. The speed and severity of the administration's response to his speech shocked Fulbright. President Johnson told his staff, bring the curtain down. Don't give Fulbright's office anything. Well, it changed the whole nature of your dealings with the, with the executive branch of the government, uh, where previously they had been very cooperative and collaborative, and you could pretty much get the information or, or that you wanted. Uh, they became very suspicious of you and, and very hostile. The fallout from the speech took an inevitable toll on the personal relationship between Fulbright and Johnson. In October, Fulbright wrote Johnson a courteous letter explaining that his speech was intended to help you in your relations with the countries of Latin America. Johnson never replied. And I still think if he had been a reasonable man at all, he wouldn't have taken it that seriously and we, we could have had a conversation about it and talked about it, but he, he was, that was one thing he was very arrogant about, you know, friends were friends regardless. Well, I never did look at like politics that way. Politics seemed to me was separate, different from just personal friendship. I never thought about it uh, in the same way that he did. At the height of the Dominican Republic crisis, Betty Fulbright, Bill's partner of nearly two decades, suffered a heart attack. She recovered, but her health was a constant concern for the rest of their time together. The senator was now severely challenged by the trouble brewing on both political and home fronts. The greatest tests, however, lay ahead. In January 1966, William Fulbright led the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in televised hearings on the war in Vietnam, questioning members of the executive branch, military officials, and historians. The hearings sought to provide an understanding of American policy in Southeast Asia. The Senate Foreign Relations Committee became the focal point for dissent. There was enormous uh, dissatisfaction in America with American foreign policy in Vietnam uh, as expressed in the White House, President Johnson and his uh, top advisors. Uh, there was no place for the American people who disagreed with that policy to go, except to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. This was being debated every place in the country, on every campus in the country with violence many times. It was debated between the parties and within the parties. Why shouldn't the Congress of the United States, the Senate of the United States, hold such hearings to bring the truth out, to have it publicly done? 
Both Secretary of State Dean Rusk and Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara testified before the committee to explain the administration's position on the war. Rusk's inability to make a strong case for military involvement in Vietnam increased the credibility of Fulbright's purpose. During McNamara's testimony regarding inaccuracies put forth about the Gulf of Tonkin attacks, sparks flew between Fulbright and the Defense Secretary. The Secretary has not seen fit to declassify information relating to sonar on the Maddox. He has kept secret important communications from the task force that indicated doubt about the reported attack on August the 4th, but released communications that served his purpose. He refers well, the hearings, I think, uh, were indispensable to uh, a better understanding, to airing points of view. I, I frankly don't understand why anyone would criticize hearings of any nature unless, like the McCarthy hearings, they were persecuting individuals. But the hearings that he conducted were very much concerned with policy, with procedures, with, with history. And uh, the more proceedings of that sort, the better. One of the great and beneficial powers of Congress lies in its investigating powers, and that should never be tampered with. You don't cut off free speech in this country. Uh, if there are people who object to a policy, uh, they have a right to state that uh, objection, and they did that in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and they did it very strongly and forcefully. Uh, did it cause problems for the Johnson administration? Well, of course it did. It made it more difficult to execute the war. Uh, but the fact is that those people turned out to be right, and the president turned out to be wrong. Lyndon Johnson and his administration did not take the debate over his foreign policy lightly. For all practical purposes, Fulbright's initiation of the hearings on Vietnam put an end to his long friendship with Johnson. The president's anger toward Fulbright was absolute. He often lashed out at the senator in telephone conversations with members of his administration. All these career people, and I got this damn fool Fulbright that fights me on everything. He wants foreign relations, and he's signed in with Chu and Lai and the Russians this morning on wanting me to stop the bombing out there. Well, he doesn't want them to stop bombing Americans and, okay. and killing people. You're, you're, you're the president. You, you make the policy. And he, he doesn't want them to stop killing secretaries in the American embassy, but he wants us to stop knocking out bridges. I don't understand, but anyway. Johnson privately warned Senator Robert F. Kennedy that he would politically destroy you, Fulbright, Church, and every one of your Dove friends in six months. It takes a lot of courage for a member of the United States Senate to challenge a president or the president if he's in your own political party. Fulbright was not some radical that, you know, thought he was advancing his own career and wanted to be in the headlines by showing he could stand up to his party's president. He liked and admired Lyndon Johnson. He supported him. He believed in him. He thought that, for all kinds of reasons, he had driven into a blind alley in Vietnam and he couldn't turn around and get out. The truth is that those hearings conducted by Senator Fulbright were as patriotic as anything he ever did in his life because he genuinely believed, as I did, that the war in uh, Vietnam was undermining the best uh, interests of America, undermining our values, undermining what we stood for in world affairs, undermining what we were as a, as a people, uh, undermining our Constitution. And not to confront that, if those were your, were your beliefs, uh, would have been virtually an act of treason. So I think that Senator uh, Fulbright should have been hailed as a great patriot when he had the courage to conduct uh, well-organized uh, hearings questioning our continued involvement in a war that was not serving uh, the interests of the United States. In numerous speeches and public appearances, Fulbright termed America's ill-advised foreign policy as the arrogance of power. 
In January of 1967, he published a book by that title. Gradually, but unmistakably, he wrote, America is showing signs of that arrogance of power which has afflicted, weakened, and in some cases destroyed great nations in the past. In doing so, we are not living up to our promise and capacity as a civilized example for the world. The measure of our falling short is the measure of the Patriot's duty of dissent. Certainly, the President and Secretary of State felt that way strongly, that, that it was hurting the war in Vietnam to have hearings and to have the opposition that Fulbright did. I think that was probably right. It certainly didn't help any, and it must have been some encouragement to North Vietnam uh, to see that kind of dissent uh, in the United States. The CIA would quite often show up in the chairman's office in the morning and show how Pravda, Isvestia, or Radio Moscow had carried whatever he had said the day before and with the implication that he was sort of helping the enemy. He didn't believe in that. He believed that, uh, you know, like everybody else, this was propaganda on their side, and he didn't care what they used his words for. What he cared about were Americans were, were being in a position where they could decide with knowledge on both sides which way they wanted to go on any foreign policy controversy, and certainly Vietnam was, was the toughest. We will have our differences and our disputes, and we will do it without questioning the intent. As the confrontation between Fulbright and Johnson heated up, the two adversaries each sought to gain public support. The nation's media served as the battleground on which each man advanced his position. And we will never surrender this world to those who want to dominate it and to those who want to destroy it. The uh, Sunday uh, talk shows on the networks were constantly calling Meet the Press and Face the Nation. Issues and Answers were the big three programs at that time. Uh, they, he was one of the most frequent guests on those programs, and they were constantly trying to, to uh, arrange uh, for him to appear. Uh, also, the, the international, we were always getting calls from the Japanese or the European uh, TV networks or European newspapers or magazines, the wire services. Uh, it, was, uh, it was constant. You know, it was exciting and, and was something that we thought was very important, and so you were willing to always try to do everything you possibly could. But uh, at times it was also a bit exhausting, certainly for Senator Fulbright as well as the staff. If any country could ever afford to withdraw, we'll say, or, or to uh, mediate or conciliate, be conciliating in this case, we can. Nobody's going to think we're a paper tiger because we make a settlement here. While Fulbright's criticism enraged Johnson, the president was careful not to have his bitterness at the Arkansan construed as a personal vendetta. He wrote to Fulbright, I cannot believe our differences over policy have erased the friendship we have shared for so long. I have a fondness for you and Betty that is real. I am sorry that careless people have appeared to paint another picture. Vietnam was a constant frustration to President Johnson because what he was interested in was the great society. He was interested, as he did in his typical, I'll say Texas fashion, but it was grandiose, we're going to eliminate poverty, we're going to eliminate sickness, we're going to eliminate crime, uh, that uh, kind of approach, and that was what interested him. And here he was all bogged down, and his time was taken on Vietnam, which was a mess, and he didn't really know what to do about it. None of us did. Johnson's distress only grew as he saw public support continue to fall away. On March 31st, 1968, President Lyndon Johnson went before a national television audience and shocked the world. I shall not seek and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. Johnson never tried to reconcile with Fulbright. In just five years, this larger-than-life figure whose career had so influenced that of William Fulbright would be dead.
Following Richard Nixon's election in 1968, Fulbright faced a president from the opposing party. He hoped Nixon would move forward with his campaign pledge to take the United States out of Southeast Asia. Fulbright waited until it was revealed that the president was sending American troops into Cambodia. Not only was Nixon expanding the scope of the war, he was doing so in secret. Fulbright was outraged at the executive branch's overreaching its authority, secretly sending troops into another country and further risking American lives. The administration's continued escalation of bombing in Southeast Asia swayed many other legislators toward Fulbright's position. Despite Nixon's re-election, by 1973, the Congress and the country had had enough. In a series of votes, Congress took action to withhold funding for the war and to rein in executive power in the use of the military. Nixon was forced to cease hostilities. At 12.30 Paris time today, January 23, 1973, the agreement on ending the war and restoring peace in Vietnam was initialed by Dr. Henry Kissinger on behalf of the United States and Special Advisor Lee Duc Tho on behalf of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. American troops were finally withdrawn from Vietnam. But for Fulbright, the end came seven years too late and at too high a cost for the United States. More than 50,000 American lives. Following his conscience on the war in Vietnam had served the nation well, but soon it proved costly to Fulbright's political career. In 1974, J. William Fulbright asked the voters of Arkansas to return him to the United States Senate for a sixth term. Unlike previous campaigns, this time Fulbright found himself a decided underdog against the state's popular governor, Dale Bumpers. I thought he was a wonderful senator. I thought the state was lucky to have a man like him in the Senate representing us, and then and not just the state, but the entire nation. He campaigned uh, hard right up until the, the last minute. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't let up, uh, he worked hard, he did everything he could, he gave it his best effort, uh, but it wasn't enough in that case. It was uh, almost unbearable to the thought that here this man who had contributed so much to the nation had been defeated by his own people when he was spent 30 years taking care of their business and taking care of it very well. But the thing I admire him the most about, that it was a late night and everybody was upset, but the Today Show called him and wanted him to appear on the Today Show the next morning, and I thought, that's pretty tough. But do you know, he did. And he said that, I think it was where he really felt, he said, that's what this system is all about. We trot our names out every four years, and the people either vote you in or vote you out. And he said, and I got voted out. Retired from politics, Fulbright led a largely private life. President Gerald Ford did offer him the ambassadorship to Britain, but despite happy memories of his Oxford days, Fulbright respectfully turned down the post. He was weary of public life, and Betty was in poor health. For many years, Betty was seriously ill. By the 1980s, she was an invalid who needed constant care. In October of 1985, she died leaving Bill Fulbright without his vibrant partner and best friend of more than 50 years. Now alone, Bill Fulbright continued work on what he considered his greatest achievement, the Fulbright Scholarship Program. In his capacity as honorary chairman of the program, Fulbright met Harriet Mayer. Harriet's intellect, vast knowledge of the world, and boundless energy appealed to Fulbright. A mutual affection developed, ultimately prompting the senator to propose. In 1990, the two married and spent the next few years traveling the world, celebrating the many successes of the Fulbright program, life-changing for its participants. The awards, accolades, and honorary degrees from international institutions were unprecedented for an American statesman. 
Among many honors, Fulbright was tapped by the Royal Society of the Arts in London, awarded the prestigious Order of the Rising Sun by the Japanese government, and presented with the Aristotle Anastasis Award in Athens. He was treated not just as a senior elder statesman, he was a superhero because he had literally transformed hundreds of thousands of lives. That Fulbright program, when a person went on to it, changed, the, expanded the whole horizon, expanded one's network, changed one's career. And so people just looked at him in wonderment and, and awe because of the effect that he had. It feels fantastic to be described as a Fulbrighter. Every time I hear it, I get a little smile on my face because it started everything. I mean, before that, yes, I had, in school, I was, you know, a good student and I would gotten all these awards and stuff, but the Fulbright was the, it, it was the hinge. It was the hinge that opened up, as I said before, it opened up the world to me. So every time I hear Fulbright, I think, that's when this larger life began. I believe because of the program, I became more of an internationalist. And that's been serving me well. Uh, again, I come back to globalization. I, come, ba I come, da come back to the global village. I come back to the fact that we're all in the same strategic boat because everything has shrunk. For me to have a, a grant, in full bright grant, was really a honor and a opportunity to come here to see, to see and to research about this one. You don't imagine the emotion that I feel. In Fulbright's lifetime, nearly a quarter of a million recipients of Fulbright scholarships from across the globe left their homes to study in other nations. President Kennedy once called the Fulbright program the classic example of beating swords into plowshares. Fulbright's contribution to halting the Cold War was subtle, something Fulbright never chose to quantify. Fortunately, he lived long enough to see the symbolic end of the struggle between East and West as the Berlin Wall came tumbling down in 1989. One evening we were watching the wall, the Berlin Wall coming down, and the music was incredible and the excitement amongst the young was simply amazing. And he looked and he said, Good heavens, he said, you know, this is the first time that I'm sorry that I'm not going to be here for very much longer because with this happening, things are really going to get interesting. On May 5th, 1993, President Bill Clinton awarded Fulbright the Presidential Medal of Freedom at a dinner for the Fulbright Scholarship Program. In the late 60s, a young Clinton had interned on Fulbright's staff, and the two had stayed close throughout their careers. Two years after receiving this high honor, in January 1995, Fulbright suffered a stroke that left him paralyzed. Three weeks later, at age 89, J. William Fulbright died at his home in Washington. We've gathered this day, for in the life of William Fulbright, his vision and his courage, his contribution to the building of community, his companionship and love have indeed been for us gifts far beyond our merit. He'll be there for, for generations to come, maybe for centuries, as I think an exemplary legislator who creatively used the system to influence events in a positive way. That's how I view Bill Fulbright. The name uh, Fulbright uh, is something that has meaning all around the world. Senator Fulbright uh, was an educator before he became a, a politician. He never quit being an educator. I always saw him as an educator, a lawyer, and a politician, maybe in that order. What he had was a good mind, a great imagination, 
and a willingness to work to develop his God-given talents, whether on the football field or in the classroom. And he was interested in other people and the rest of the world. J.W. Fulbright's life is the story of a man who rose from Arkansas's Ozark Mountains to become one of the most influential men in the world. His politically rooted position on civil rights haunted Fulbright throughout his life, particularly when history showed it to be mistaken. But his stand against Joseph McCarthy was a brave display of leadership, and the creation of the scholarship program that bears his name proved Bill Fulbright a true visionary. His willingness to challenge policies he believed harmful to the country stands as an example of great political courage. In his final address as a United States Senator, Fulbright reflected on his career. If I am remembered, I suppose it will be as a dissenter. That was not what I had in mind. But when things go contrary to your highest hopes and strongest convictions, there is nothing you can do except dissent or drop out. Bill Fulbright also left us the power of his example, always the teacher and always the student. Thank you, friend, and Godspeed. <laughs>